segment, I talked about the preeminent statement that I use to launch into gospel conversations. And that is, I believe the Bible. And the Bible gives us both bad news and good news. The bad news is all about us. The good news is all about God. Let me tell you about the bad news first. That is exactly what I say. I have memorized that statement. I have said it probably hundreds of times in my life. I'd encourage you to write it down and memorize it. Now, the reason why we want to start with the bad news first in all of our gospel conversations, in all of our evangelism efforts, is simply because the gospel actually doesn't make sense apart from the bad news. Let me give you an illustration. I didn't come up with this illustration on my own. I, I sort of borrowed this from a prominent evangelist and prominent preacher. And regardless of what you think of that particular preacher, I, think, I believe that this illustration and metaphor is extremely valuable. Let's say you are on an airplane. And as you're sitting there, the flight attendant comes up to you and says, hey, I want to give you this life jacket. And you say, uh, okay, why? This seems a little bit odd. And what if the flight attendant says to you, this life jacket will give you peace and happiness and joy. It will help you through all your problems. This life jacket is really important. Please put it on. Please, 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 please put it on. And you say, uh, okay, sure, I'll, I'll give it a try. And you put the life jacket on and you sit down in your chair. It's really uncomfortable. You, you really can't move in your seat. It's a little bit annoying and a little bit frustrating, but okay, she, she really wanted you to do it and it seemed like a good idea, so you went with it and she promised it would give you joy and peace in your heart, weirdly, but okay, fine. Let's say you're sitting there and you try to get up to go to the bathroom and you, you really can't get out of your seat all that well because it's, it's, it's too cumbersome. And it's all sort of inconvenient all the way around. And then as you're, as you're sitting there, let's say a, a different flight attendant is coming down the row and accidentally spills hot tea on your, on your lap. And now you've got this burning hot tea on your lap. And you're thinking to yourself, ah, this life jacket didn't help me at all. If anything, it's actually made my life more difficult. And, and the, the previous flight attendant told me that if I kept the life jacket on, it would somehow be helpful to me when I face difficulties. Well, I'm, I'm facing a difficulty now, and it's not helping me. So never mind. You take the life jacket off, and you throw it down, and you say to yourself, I tried that once. There's no point in me trying it again. Now, that's one manner of trying to get people to do what you want them to do. Let's switch that up a little bit. Let's say a flight attendant came to you, and rather than just convincing you or seemingly trying to convince you to put on the life jacket, let's say the flight attendant came to you and said, I have some inside information. The pilot just told me the flight's about to crash into the ocean. We're headed down. We might die. And every person not wearing a life jacket will definitely die. They will drown. But if you put this life jacket on, it will save your life. In that moment, all of a sudden, you're no longer thinking to yourself about all the hope and joy and peace that that life jacket might bring you on that flight. You recognize that the life jacket will rescue you from the impending doom that you are facing. And even if the other flight attendant comes down the aisle and spills burning hot tea on your lap, it may hurt. It may be frustrating, it may be painful, but you're not taking that life jacket off. Why? Because you know that something's about to happen. And apart from that life jacket, you're in trouble. You see, if you don't clearly communicate to someone the impending doom first, the solution to the impending doom doesn't make sense. Now, that illustration is a little bit silly, and obviously I use that in a, in a way with some hyperbole, but... But I think, I think it gives us some insight into how, how flawed we are in some of our evangelistic approaches. Sometimes people will go up to you and say, oh, you should follow Jesus. He'll give you hope and joy and peace. And I do believe Jesus does give us hope and joy and peace. And sometimes people will say, well, Jesus will protect you from all the bad things in this world, which I'm not so sure Orthodox Christianity would endorse. Or people say, Oh, or Jesus will help you through all your difficult times, which I definitely would agree with, and I would say that Orthodox Christianity certainly does endorse. In fact, Jesus does say that in this life we will have trials and tribulations that will take place, and Jesus promised us to be with us. In fact, in one of the greatest calls to evangelism in Matthew 28, Jesus says, 
I will be with you until the end of the age. We praise God that he promises to be with us. But ultimately, that's not the impetus for salvation. Or at least it's not the initial impetus for gospel conversation. The initial impetus, the initial reason for why we have gospel conversations, the reason why we share the good news is because there's bad news. And the good news, apart from the bad news, doesn't make sense. In fact, the good news, apart from the bad news, not only does it not make sense, but it actually is offensive and awkward. Imagine this. Imagine someone came up to you and said, hey, I paid your speeding ticket. What would you say? You would say, what speeding ticket? What are you talking about? I don't have a speeding ticket. You're actually offended by the fact that they offered to pay your speeding ticket. You're not excited about the fact that they paid the penalty for you because you didn't realize there was a penalty in the first place. This is exactly what we do in our gospel conversations. We say to someone, Jesus loves you. He died for you. But they'll say, I didn't need someone to die for me. In fact, I, I once heard a, an interview on a late night talk show with a comedian who was trying to make a joke. Quite frankly, his joke was, was blasphemous. He made a joke about growing up Catholic, and he said, yeah, I recognize that Jesus died for me, but, but I wish he would have asked first. You know, I don't really need anyone dying for me. Isn't that a little bit presumptuous? I mean, is it a little bit arrogant for him to think I needed him to die for me? And the audience was laughing, and the, the host laughed. And I remember watching this interview during his show and being a little bit angry. But then my, my anger turned to sadness. It, it made me sad to think that this comedian and many people like him around the globe don't realize that they actually need someone to die for them. You see, the good news doesn't make sense apart from the bad news. In the case of this comedian, he thought I was ridiculous and sort of arrogant that Jesus would assume that he needed a savior. But this comedian does need a savior. And Jesus is the only adequate savior. So if I was sitting down and having a conversation with this comedian, the first thing I would tell him is, there's some really bad news. And that's really, really important. The last thing I want to mention before we close up this segment is this. It's important to remember that when you're talking about the bad news, you're not trying to convince people to believe what you believe. You're simply educating them on what you believe. Going back to the conversation I had that night at the ballpark, I wasn't trying to tell these guys that I thought they should embrace what I believe. I was simply telling them, listen, I believe the Bible, and the Bible gives us both bad news and good news. I believe the bad news in the Bible is all about us. I believe the good news that's in the Bible is all about God. Let me tell you about the bad news. You see, the bad news talks about how sinful I believe we are. Again, I'm not trying to convince them to believe that they're sinners. I'm simply trying to tell them that I believe that we are sinners. I'm not trying to be a salesperson. I'm trying to be an educator. I'm not trying to seal the deal. I'm trying to inspire and simply talk about what I believe to be true. I'm not a prosecutor. I'm a witness. I am testifying about that which I believe. Always remember that as you're having these sorts of gospel conversations. In the next segment, I'm going to unpack in more detail what to say when you're sharing the bad news.